Hey guys, welcome back to part two of this uh, seascape painting tutorial. So, sorry it's taken me a while to get this out if you've been waiting for it, but anyway, here it is. We'll go and roll the video now and I'll talk on my way through it. And happy painting. Right here guys, so this is where we left off in part one. This was the initial block and layer of paint. And today, on this video, we're gonna go through to this stage here, where that painting's really starting to come together. Um, it's actually really starting to look like a proper seascape by this stage. So that's over in about the next half an hour. But here we go right now. And I'll talk about the actual process, method, but right now we'll just launch into what I'm actually doing there. This is me starting to put in features like the foam and the whitewash in the distance. So this is in the very distance, and I'll speed up some of this because otherwise this is going to take days to watch this video because it does take many hours to paint a painting like this. So I said we'll watch it all in real time, but that's just ridiculous really. So the right color in the right place. That mauve color, if you're going on from part one, you would have seen me make up these colors. If not, go back and watch part one or watch the color mixing at the end anyway, and you'll see the mauve, which is ultramarine blue, titanium white, and a little bit of pyrrole rubine in my case, or you could be using alizarin red alizarin to make that mauve color and now that white that you're seeing at the top there that won't be white white it might look white on the video right now because you haven't got another reference beside it but trust me if i was to put white paint on there it would be really really white so that's quite just a light mauve and now that's interesting there because i'm going in and i'm darkening some of my initial block in so and I'm, when I'm darkening it like that, I'm darkening with it, I suppose you'd call it a glaze, but it's also hardly any paint. So maybe it's like a glaze slash scumble. Scumbling's when you're almost scrubbing in dry paint onto your painting, and you'll be changing the actual, it's still transparent, and a glaze is obviously like a wash. So when I glaze, I use Lequin and a little bit of paint. And I don't, I don't turn it into a glaze by using lots of Lequin because that's not good for your paint layer. So I use a bit of Lequin and a little bit of paint and I almost scrub it in. So it is wet, but it's, yes, there's not a lot of liquid going on my painting. And I'm still glazing there, you can see that? It's very transparent. I'm definitely not getting good coverage there with that paint. But when I'm putting the light colors on, they're going on quite opaque. And that's something that's how I paint. After that initial block in, when I darken things, I'm often using a glaze or a scumble, and my highlights or my lighter colors are going in quite opaque where I'm actually literally just painting with quite thick paint. How thick do I mix my paint? Another good question. Um, I mix my paint to about the consistency of soft butter. That's what I tell the students if they ever come to my studio, we're going for soft butter because there's a tendency to add enough liquid to your paint um, to make it like milk or cream. And that's not good because you, you don't get coverage. So it's gotta be like soft butter when you're painting. Don't know whether I talked about this in the block and layer, hopefully I did, but yeah, soft butter guys, not milk. And don't fall into this trap. You haven't quite mixed up enough paint, so you add more medium with it to try and make it go further. That's not a valid shortcut. That only causes you problems going ahead in the future. So you've got to learn to mix that paint. So, but it does take practice, granted. So one of the, when you're learning, mix more paint than you need. Yeah, then you're like, oh yeah, but that's gonna affect my wallet. Paint costs money, I don't wanna throw any out, but, you're gonna be better off throwing a little bit of paint in. You probably won't throw it out. Put it in the fridge or the freezer anyway. I'm diverging all the time. But anyway, what you wanna do is mix more paint than you need so you don't have to try. A, you don't try and put more medium with it that can make it go further. Or B, you actually come back and you can't quite mix that color again and then you look like a real amateur. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but you do. If you don't, if you mix, if you're blocking in a sky, and you block in three quarters of it, and then you run out of paint, and you have to try and block it, mix the colour, but you can't mix that same colour again, 
that's probably one of the real telltale, telltale signs of someone who hasn't been painting much. So mix more paint than you need so you'll look like a pro until you learn to mix accurate colour all the time. Because once you learn to mix accurate colour, you can just mix that same colour again. Particularly, it's a little bit easier if you're using a limit, limited palette like I am, because if you've got 20 tubes of paint out and you can't remember what tubes you use to make that colour, oh man, you're just, that's hard work. So, so what am I doing there? Back to watching the painting. So that's some glazing going on and I'm also putting in that floating foam. That floating foam that moves, that gets, that gets sucked up by the wave. Now that, what I'm doing there, that floating foam is actually trickier than it looks. Um, yeah, that takes a bit of practice. Now when I do it, you see me doing it there, you would have seen me doing it before, I do it in a really like gestural way and I don't necessarily copy the photograph. So it's more of a gestural movement and I just, I just put a little bit in, a few paint strokes in and I'm always standing back to see how they look. See me, I'm doing it right there. I move my whole arm a lot and I just chuck it in and I see what it looks like. I can take a little bit off, but I don't delicately copy the photograph or paint it in in a way that looks illustrated. It doesn't work for me. I've tried it. I see people who do and I, I like their results, you know. Their paintings, you know, they paint that foam in and it looks quite... See, now that you step back, you get the... See, I was really in the distance there. But anyway, yeah, that floating foam, as it creeps up the wave, you'll see, if you just jump on Instagram, you're going to see quite a few people painting similar works and uh, getting similar results, but doing it in a far different way. Hope that makes sense. Anyway. Mauve at the bottom. And then a little bit of a highlight at the top. And then this floating foam moving up the wave. That's all it is. This is just gonna be happening over and over again. There's so much to talk about though. Now, getting back to the very beginning, when I said I'd let that painting dry, I blocked it in, then I let it dry, and then I'm coming back on the second layer. Well, how long do you let it dry for? How long do you let your painting dry for? So I let mine dry for two or three days. And bearing in mind, I'm using Winsor and Le Newton's Le Quin as my medium. So that's actually a fast drying medium. So to be honest, it would be dry, sort of touch dry overnight, but I give it two or three days. So that means that that bottom layer is fairly hard. So I can actually go ahead. If I did make a mistake or I wanted to wipe a bit of paint off that I'm putting on, I can wipe a bit of that paint off and that first layer will stay where it is. That's a handy little thing to be able to do because I sometimes use that almost as a technique sharpening up my edges, but more importantly, for you people watching this video, if you're a beginner, being able to wipe that paint off while still leaving that first layer of paint there, that's a real handy thing. That means you get another go if you make a mistake. Now, sometimes when you do wipe that paint off, you do, it does discolor some of your first layer, but what the hell, you get to have another go when you're learning. It's great, just use it. You can't do that with acrylics, you know? It's gonna be dry before you know it. With oil paint, you need to have another go. Now, did you just notice how I darkened that whole area that I'm working on with a glaze? Glaze slash scumble. You know how I do it. Hardly any paint and a little bit of Lequin. And now, gesturally, I was just making some sort of water shapes. Okay, you see me using, that's a synthetic flat brush I'm using there, but I have been using a variety of brushes up until now in this video, so we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, a mix of bristle and flat nylon, brush, synthetic nylon brushes like that one. But this floating foam. And see the way I gesturally just sort of suggest, suggest some, I'll oh, see how my, 
See how my hand moves and it doesn't put any paint on sometimes? That's weird. Look at my hand moving and no paint's going on. That's how gestural it is, it's like, it keeps it really random. I don't know, look at it. Now you'll see some white paint, and I say it again, that is not white paint, that just looks white. That won't be my lightest light, so I'll save them till last. That's just a lot lighter than what's already on there. And I'm heavily using my um, photo reference too. So I'm using that to guide me of what color to put where. Now I don't think this video here, this was filmed over a couple of different days, but essentially it's all one layer going in. Um, but I didn't do this all in one day. This does take quite a, quite a lot of time actually. Not as long as it took to make this video. <laughs> the video takes quite a while to make. Yeah, so just slowly working on that foam. The floating foam is really good for giving you movement in your seascape. It's so good. So I think, looking at what I'm doing here, this is actually a day, remember I darkened that area just before, like a couple of minutes ago you saw me darken that area. I think that's dried overnight and I'm coming back with another layer. So you could say I'm a liar and that's actually a third layer going on there. So sometimes if you do darken, if you have to darken something up, because you're not going to get it, well, you probably won't get it perfect in your blocking layer. When you're coming back you want to, you know, darken some areas. But you've got that flexibility to do it. You can darken it with a glaze, you can lighten it with a glaze. And then you come in and you can paint these, these are water shapes. That's not actually floating foam. Don't ask me to explain the difference at this stage. Hopefully you'll just see it sort of appear. Wave shapes. Wave shapes. Remember that transition? You've got a hard edge, a hard dark edge, then it goes into the lighter paint, then that transitions back up slowly to the hard dark edge again. Probably easy to draw your picture. I've drawn that picture in a previous video. But you look at that wave where my hand is right now. It goes up, goes slowly, gets darker, darker, up to that dark edge, then it goes hard edge back to light. And you just repeat that process over and over again and you're painting waves. And when I'm creating that water shape, I'm actually doing that within a wave multiple times. And now what I just explained to you gets a little bit confusing down here because you go, oh, you when it's going from darker, it's going lighter. But that's where the, the light is shining through that wave up near the crest of the wave where the waves actually, the volume of water is quite thin so the light can come through. That's the exception to the rule of getting darker as it goes up the wave before that hard edge. Oh, jeepers. I sound like I'm even confusing myself sometimes, but... What I'm doing there is I'm making that really dark down underneath where that wave's curling over because that's creating a shadow and I'm just, you know, look at that. Using, look how much I use just transparent layers of paint just to make those little adjustments. And it's so forgiving because remembering that at this stage, if you mess up, you can actually wipe that paint off. Now, look, I'm down there with a I don't know what sort of brush that is. I think that is an ivory, probably an ivory, yep, it's an ivory filbert from Rosemary & Co. So those ivory, um, that ivory range of brushes, I really do like them, the, the synthetic bristle. So I'm using that in there. And that mauve, that's actually really dark. Because we've been painting this wave in my studio and if there was a one mistake that everyone makes, they see foam and they think it's basically white. But it is so dark in areas. But it doesn't, yeah, so you just gotta, what I'm doing in my studio is there are people are painting that foam that I just started down the bottom there 
and they start doing it too light, I actually hold up a piece of white paper next to the reference photo and I say, well, that paper is white, so look at the color of the phone. Then you oh, well, it's so, it's very dark compared to white, white, so. That comes back to painting what you see, not what you think. Because everyone thinks the foam is white, so the first thing they do is they go and grab some white paint. Well, it's not white. It's very dark, mauve. A lot of volume within your burst of foam or your breaking wave, and you create that volume with darks and lights with your tone. Here we go. This is nitty gritty now. This is Wayne Vickers painting nitty gritty little details. Flicking around in there. Oh, by the way, when we we're talking about paint drying before, you'll notice that when you leave it two or three days, the light colors take longer to dry. And that is, we're not doing a science lesson, but apparently I've heard that that is because the dark colors attract more heat, obviously. So that's why the light colors take much longer to dry. There might be another scientific reason as well, but a scientist actually told me that. Okay, a little bit of brush talk now. Um, so that brush that I'm using there, that's back with that ivory filbert from Rosemary & Co. So that ivory range, it's a synthetic bristle brush. It's actually vegan friendly, if that worries you. Um, so synthetic bristles, and they're, they're very uniform. I would say that's one thing about them, they are very uniform. They haven't got the randomness of an actual bristle brush, which I do like sometimes, but these things, like I think that is now, now I think I'm actually using an ivory dagger brush. Yeah, so there you go. They last a long time, and that's always really good. Brushes that you, great value for money. You've got to spend a little bit more money to get better brushes, but if they last a long time, that's great. Okay, now the one, the new little exciting brush that I've been playing with, and I was actually using it at the start of this video when I watched it back, but I didn't mention it, is actually the Tish Dagger. So um, I'm sure if you're watching this on YouTube, you already know about Andrew Tischler, because he's a legend, but he lives here in New Zealand in the South Island. So I went and saw Andrew, and he actually gave me one of these beautiful Tish Daggers. So I bought it home, and I will be honest, it did sit in my studio for a little while before I, I tried it and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. And I went back to using what I know. But recently I've got right into that Tish Dagger and I've gone and bought like a whole range of them, different sizes, the big ones and the small ones. Um, it is a really, well, this way I'm finding it, it's a really random bristle brush. And it's really good for making random marks and blocking and so you would, if you, yeah, you saw, you actually saw me using it in the distance, blocking in some of that white water. Um, and I'm finding it really good. Right now I'm painting a lot of mountainscapes here in New Zealand, and I'm finding it really good for making tussock shapes or making, um, blocking in my rocky bluffs, rock faces, etc. It's a good brush to get some really nice um, brush marks on your painting and to get quite a, a good amount of paint on your painting too, in a really random way, which, hey, we're always battling that. How do you get random brush strokes on your painting? One way that I get random brush strokes with these, because I you notice I use a lot of these synthetic flat brushes that I'm using right there. One way I get random brush strokes is as I paint, I often roll my fingers so that brush rolls around and makes the thickness of the line varies, or else you press harder or softer. Obviously, if you're pressing softer and you're using on the razor's edge, it's gonna make a really thin stroke, but if you press harder, it um, makes it thicker as well. So there's all these different ways you can change the randomness of your brush, the brush marks you're making on your painting. Now, when you see me, I'll wait till I come back to it. Might not come back to it. That's the ivory dagger again. That's as close as I'm ever gonna get to using like a zero, zero sort of brush. 
I don't really do small brushes besides signing my name. Never say never. I might get more detailed in the future. That, that ivory dagger there, it's got a nice little point on it though. I don't mind getting more detailed in the foreground. I just don't, I just really don't like detail in the distance. I avoid it. All right, so brush care. How do I, how do I care for my brushes? Um, I will be honest and I will say that I'm not sure but I think I did get this idea from Caesar Santos actually and that's um, using an oil bath so I've got a little oil bath that I put my brushes in um, often when I'm working day to day say I was working on this painting um, day in day out at the end of the day rather than washing those brushes I just put them in an oil bath and I think I've got like olive oil or some oil from inside so it's not I'm not sure how, I wash the oil off before I start painting again. I'm not painting with olive oil, for crying out loud. I'm actually washing the brushes, but it does keep the brushes nice and soft and supple, and it makes them last quite a while. So I might not wash them. I might just put them straight in that bath at the end of the day, and the next day I come out, I just rinse all the oil off and I start painting again. But like, alternatively, if you're going away for a bit of time, you might actually wash the brushes and what I wash them in solvent and then I do dunk them in that oil again just to keep them nice and oiled. If there's any paint that's left on the brush it won't go hard. The oil, the oil seems to stop it from going hard. Likewise when I'm painting and I've got these colours on my palette I should just put my palette in the fridge or the freezer overnight so it doesn't so I don't have to clean off all that paint. Um, so it's a really easy process oil painting. You just put your brushes in some in an oil bath and put your palette in the freezer and go inside. Turn the lights off. Finish for the day. You've seen me doing that floating foam in the foreground. You'll see there's a big variety of tones in that floating foam. There's some that looks quite light, almost white, and it goes back and as it goes, as it's sweeping up that wave that curl of that wave sucking that foam up it up into that dark part of that wave it's getting really light oh getting really dark sorry jeepers it's getting dark up into there hard to just grasp how the variety of tone just in that foreground part of the painting and it's that it's the lights and darks that that sort of the, that make the magic in your painting like for instance the light that's starting to come through that first wave, like that iridescent green glow that's coming through that wave, it's starting to look like it is glowing a little bit, that, but that's big because right beside that green glow is that really dark little bit in the front. So it's that light next to dark. So you're always looking for that. Even you're trying to almost, you know, create it a little bit in your paintings. Or if you're looking for a reference photo, those are the type of things you might be looking for little areas of light next to dark, or warm next to cool colours. That's what makes the magic. So this foreground foam, racing up the beach, this is where it's racing up the beach to meet you at your feet. This is, this is a little bit tedious. And this is a little bit tedious. Um, so there we go, I'm gonna let it play for a bit because it's just this front but if it interests you, keep watching. If you're bored out of your brain, um, happy painting. <laughs> but um, I'll let it play for a little bit and I'll catch you at the end.
So um, if you've been watching this for the last little bit, you would have noticed that I'm jumping around a lot, moving from the foreground into the background and vice versa, mid-ground when I'm painting now. So that the initial layer, when I block in, I paint from the distant, from the top of the canvas down, so it's from the distance into the foreground. And that just works really well for me. That's the, sort of the way my mind works. I know there are people that paint the foreground or they start and then they might come back and paint the sky further into the painting that really I just that really does screw with my mind I couldn't do that myself but anyway it works for some people um, and the second reason for me painting from the top to the bottom is if I get wet paint I probably lessen my chance of dragging my arm through it so yeah, that's a common sense reason and so I do that on the block and layer and I do that on the second pass as well I largely work from a distance forwards but after that I start painting the painting as a whole so that's where you see me working in the foreground and the distant all at the same time because so I'm just seeing how that painting is developed developing as an entire picture for me so I'm walking back and looking at the painting from a distance and coming up and making alterations all the time yeah, that's how it works for me. And further on, probably what you're going to see, and there will be a part three, it won't be as long as this, it's probably just a little details at the end, but you'll see me then comparing my painting to the reference photo. It's actually where I either look through a mirror or actually I actually take photos with my phone and just compare the two between the reference photo and the painting. That's all coming up in part three, so I'll explain that then. Um, good luck if you're at home doing a seascape. Uh, man, if this is helping, that's great. If you've sat through this and it's not helping, that's just crazy. But, so hopefully it is helping. <laughs> and I think it will cross the board. It won't matter what seascape you're doing, what color scheme you're using. Some of these little techniques like glazing and darkening and lighting areas of your painting, um, that really should help you going forward. So, there we have it. Happy painting, and have a lovely day, and we'll catch you again on the next video. Oh, and remember, if you did enjoy it, please subscribe, like, and subscribe to my channel, and I'll keep making videos. Thank you.